Section 9 of Winesburg, Ohio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Winesburg, Ohio, by Sherwood Anderson. Section 9. Godliness. Part 3. Surrender. The story of Louise Bentley, who became Mrs. John Hardy and lived with her husband in a brick house on Elm Street in Winesburg, is a story of misunderstanding. Before such women as Louise can be understood and their lives made livable, much will have to be done. Thoughtful books will have to be written, and thoughtful lives lived by people about them. Born of a delicate and overworked mother and an impulsive, hard, imaginative father, who did not look with favor upon her coming into the world, Louise was from childhood a neurotic, one of the race of oversensitive women that in later days industrialism was to bring in such great numbers into the world. During her early years she lived on the Bentley farm, a silent, moody child, wanting love more than anything else in the world, and not getting it. When she was fifteen she went to live in Winesburg with the family of Albert Hardy, who had a store for the sale of buggies and wagons, and who was a member of the town board of education. Louise went into town to be a student in the Winesburg High School, and she went to live at the Hardys because Albert Hardy and her father were friends. Hardy, the vehicle merchant of Winesburg, like thousands of other men of his times, was an enthusiast on the subject of education. He had made his own way in the world without learning got from books, but he was convinced that had he but known books, things would have gone better with him. To everyone who came into his shop he talked of the matter, and in his own household he drove his family distracted by his constant harping on the subject. He had two daughters and one son, John Hardy, and more than once the daughters threatened to leave school altogether. As a matter of principle they did just enough work in their classes to avoid punishment. I hate books and I hate anyone who likes books, Harriet, the younger of the two girls, declared passionately. In Winesburg, as on the farm, Louise was not happy. For years she had dreamed of the time when she could go forth into the world, and she looked upon the move into the Hardy household as a great step in the direction of freedom. Always when she had thought of the matter it had seemed to her that in town all must be gaiety and life, that there men and women must live happily and freely, giving and taking friendship and affection, as one takes the feel of a wind on the cheek. After the silence and the cheerlessness of life in the Bentley house, she dreamed of stepping forth into an atmosphere that was warm and pulsating with life and reality, and in the Hardy household Louise might have got something of the thing for which she so hungered, but for a mistake she made when she had just come to town. Louise won the disfavor of the two Hardy girls, Mary and Harriet, by her application to her studies in school. She did not come to the house until the day when school was to begin, and knew nothing of the feeling they had in the matter. She was timid, and during the first month made no acquaintances. Every Friday afternoon one of the hired men from the farm drove into Winesburg and took her home for the weekend, so that she did not spend the Saturday holiday with the town people. Because she was embarrassed and lonely, she worked constantly at her studies, to Mary and Harriet it seemed as though she tried to make trouble for them by her proficiency. In her eagerness to appear well, Louise wanted to answer every question put to the class by the teacher. She jumped up and down, and her eyes flashed. Then, when she had answered some question the others in the class had been unable to answer, she smiled happily. "'See, I have done it for you,' her eyes seemed to say. "'You need not bother about the matter. I will answer all the questions.' For the whole class it will be easy while I am here. In the evening after supper in the Hardy house, Albert Hardy began to praise Louise. One of the teachers had spoken highly of her, and he was delighted. Well, again I have heard it, he began, looking hard at his daughters, and then turning to smile at Louise. Another of the teachers has told me of the good work Louise is doing. Everyone in Winesburg is telling me how smart she is. I am ashamed that they do not speak so of my own girls. 
Arising, the merchant marched about the room and lighted his evening cigar. The two girls looked at each other and shook their heads wearily. Seeing their indifference, the father became angry. "'I tell you, it is something for you two to be thinking about,' he cried, glaring at them. "'There is a big change coming here in America, and in learning is the only hope of the coming generations. Louise is the daughter of a rich man, but she is not ashamed to study. It should make you ashamed to see what she does.' The merchant took his hat from a rack by the door and prepared to depart for the evening. At the door he stopped and glared back. So fierce was his manner that Louise was frightened, and ran upstairs to her own room. The daughters began to speak of their own affairs. "'Pay attention to me!' roared the merchant. "'Your minds are lazy. Your indifference to education is affecting your characters. You will amount to nothing. Now mark what I say. Louise will be so far ahead of you that you will never catch up.' The distracted man went out of the house and into the street, shaking with wrath. He went along muttering words and swearing, but when he got into Main Street his anger passed. He stopped to talk of the weather or the crops with some other merchant or with a farmer who had come into town, and forgot his daughters altogether, or, if he thought of them, only shrugged his shoulders. "'Oh, well, girls will be girls,' he muttered philosophically." In the house, when Louise came down into the room where the two girls sat, they would have nothing to do with her. One evening, after she had been there for more than six weeks, and was heartbroken because of the continued air of coldness with which she was always greeted, she burst into tears. "'Shut up your crying and go back to your own room and to your books,' Mary Hardy said sharply. The room occupied by Louise was on the second floor of the Hardy house, and her window looked out upon an orchard. There was a stove in the room, and every evening young John Hardy carried up an armful of wood, and put it in a box that stood by the wall. During the second month after she came to the house, Louise gave up all hope of getting on a friendly footing with the Hardy girls, and went to her own room as soon as the evening meal was at an end. Her mind began to play with thoughts of making friends with John Hardy. When he came into the room with the wood in his arms, she pretended to be busy with her studies, but watched him eagerly. When he had put the wood in the box and turned to go out, she put down her head and blushed. She tried to make talk, but could say nothing, and after he had gone she was angry at herself for her stupidity. The mind of the country girl became filled with the idea of drawing close to the young man, she thought that in him might be found the quality she had all her life been seeking in people. It seemed to her that between herself and all the other people in the world a wall had been built up, and that she was living just on the edge of some warm inner circle of life that must be quite open and understandable to others. She became obsessed with the thought that it wanted but a courageous act on her part to make all of her association with people something quite different and that it was possible by such an act to pass into a new life as one opens a door and goes into a room. Day and night she thought of the matter, but although the thing she wanted so earnestly was something very warm and close, it had as yet no conscious connection with sex. It had not become that definite, and her mind had only alighted upon the person of John Hardy because he was at hand, and unlike his sisters, had not been unfriendly to her. The Hardy sisters, Mary and Harriet, were both older than Louise. In a certain kind of knowledge of the world, they were years older. They lived as all of the young women of Middle Western towns lived. In those days, young women did not go out of our towns to Eastern colleges, and ideas in regard to social classes had hardly begun to exist. A daughter of a laborer was in much the same social position as the daughter of a farmer or a merchant and there were no leisure classes. A girl was nice, or she was not nice. If a nice girl, she had a young man who came to her house to see her on Sunday and on Wednesday evenings. Sometimes she went with her young man to a dance or a church social. At other times she received him at the house and was given the use of the parlor for that purpose. No one intruded upon her. For hours the two sat behind closed doors, Sometimes the lights were turned low, and the young man and woman embraced. Cheeks became hot, and hair disarranged. 
after a year or two, if the impulse within them became strong and insistent enough, they married. One evening, during her first winter in Winesburg, Louise had an adventure that gave a new impulse to her desire to break down the wall that she thought stood between her and John Hardy. It was Wednesday, and immediately after the evening meal, Albert Hardy put on his hat and went away. Young John brought the wood and put it in the box in Louise's room. "'You do work hard, don't you?' he said awkwardly. And then, before she could answer, he also went away. Louise heard him go out of the house and had a mad desire to run after him. Opening her window, she leaned out and called softly, "'John, dear John, come back. Don't go away.' The night was cloudy, and she could not see far into the darkness. But as she waited, she fancied she could hear a soft little noise, as of someone going on tiptoes through the trees in the orchard. She was frightened and closed the window quickly. For an hour she moved about the room, trembling with excitement, and when she could not longer bear the waiting, she crept into the hall and down the stairs into a closet-like room that opened off the parlor. Louise had decided that she would perform the courageous act that had for weeks been in her mind. She was convinced that John Hardy had concealed himself in the orchard beneath her window, and she was determined to find him and tell him that she wanted him to come close to her, to hold her in his arms, to tell her of his thoughts and dreams, and to listen while she told him her thoughts and dreams. "'In the darkness it will be easier to say things,' she whispered to herself, as she stood in the little room, groping for the door. And then suddenly Louise realized that she was not alone in the house. In the parlor on the other side of the door, a man's voice spoke softly, and the door opened. Louise just had time to conceal herself in a little opening beneath the stairway, when Mary Hardy, accompanied by her young man, came into the little dark room. For an hour Louise sat on the floor in the darkness and listened. Without words, Mary Hardy, with the aid of the man who had come to spend the evening with her, brought to the country girl a knowledge of men and women. Putting her head down until she was curled into a little ball, she lay perfectly still. It seemed to her that by some strange impulse of the gods, a great gift had been brought to Mary Hardy, and she could not understand the older woman's determined protest. The young man took Mary Hardy into his arms and kissed her. When she struggled and laughed, he but held her more tightly. For an hour the contest between them went on, and then they went back into the parlor, and Louise escaped up the stairs. "'I hope you were quiet out there. You must not disturb the little mouse at her studies,' she heard Harriet saying to her sister, as she stood by her own door in the hallway above. Louise wrote a note to John Hardy, and late that night, when all in the house were asleep, she crept downstairs and slipped it under his door. She was afraid that if she did not do the thing at once, her courage would fail. In the note she tried to be quite definite about what she wanted. I want someone to love me, and I want to love someone, she wrote. If you are the one for me, I want you to come into the orchard at night and make a noise under my window. It will be easy for me to crawl down over the shed and come to you. I am thinking about it all the time, so if you are to come at all, you must come soon. For a long time Louise did not know what would be the outcome of her bold attempt to secure for herself a lover. In a way she still did not know whether or not she wanted him to come. Sometimes it seemed to her that to be held tightly and kissed was the whole secret of life, and then a new impulse came and she was terribly afraid. The age-old woman's desire to be possessed had taken possession of her, but so vague was her notion of life that it seemed to her that just the touch of John Hardy's hand upon her own hand would satisfy. She wondered if he would understand that. At the table next day, while Albert Hardy talked and the two girls whispered and laughed, she did not look at John but at the table, and as soon as possible escaped. In the evening she went out of the house until she was sure he had taken the wood to her room and gone away. When, after several evenings of intense listening, she heard no call from the darkness in the orchard, she was half beside herself with grief. 
and decided that for her there was no way to break through the wall that had shut her off from the joy of life. And then, on a Monday evening, two or three weeks after the writing of the note, John Hardy came for her. Louise had so entirely given up the thought of his coming that for a long time she did not hear the call that came up from the orchard. On the Friday evening before, as she was being driven back to the farm for the weekend by one of the hired men, she had on an impulse done a thing that had startled her, and as John Hardy stood in the darkness below and called her name softly and insistently, she walked about in her room and wondered what new impulse had led her to commit so ridiculous an act. The farmhand, a young fellow with black curly hair, had come for her somewhat late on that Friday evening, and they drove home in the darkness. Louise, whose mind was filled with thoughts of John Hardy, tried to make talk, but the country boy was embarrassed and would say nothing. Her mind began to review the loneliness of her childhood, and she remembered with a pang the sharp new loneliness that had just come to her. "'I hate everyone!' she cried suddenly, and then broke forth into a tirade that frightened her escort. "'I hate father and the old man Hardy, too,' she declared vehemently. "'I get my lessons there in the school in town, but I hate that also.' Louise frightened the farmhand still more by turning and putting her cheek down upon his shoulder. Vaguely, she hoped that he, like that young man who had stood in the darkness with Mary, would put his arms about her and kiss her. But the country boy was only alarmed. He struck the horse with the whip and began to whistle. Oh, "'The road is rough, eh?' he said loudly. Louise was so angry that, reaching up, she snatched his hat from his head and threw it into the road. When he jumped out of the buggy and went to get it, she drove off and left him to walk the rest of the way back to the farm. Louise Bentley took John Hardy to be her lover. That was not what she wanted, but it was so the young man had interpreted her approach to him, and so anxious was she to achieve something else that she made no resistance. When, after a few months, they were both afraid that she was about to become a mother, they went one evening to the county seat and were married. For a few months they lived in the Hardy house, and then took a house of their own. All during the first year, Louise tried to make her husband understand the vague and intangible hunger that had led to the writing of the note, and that was still unsatisfied. Again and again she crept into his arms and tried to talk of it, but always without success. Filled with his own notions of love between men and women, he did not listen, but began to kiss her upon the lips. That confused her, so that in the end she did not want to be kissed. She did not know what she wanted. When the alarm that had tricked them into marriage proved to be groundless, she was angry, and said bitter, hurtful things. Later, when her son David was born, she could not nurse him, and did not know whether she wanted him or not. Sometimes she stayed in the room with him all day, walking about and occasionally creeping close to touch him tenderly with her hands, and then other days came when she did not want to see or be near the tiny bit of humanity that had come into the house. When John Hardy reproached her for her cruelty, she laughed. "'It is a man-child, and will get what it wants anyway,' she said sharply. "'Had it been a woman-child, there is nothing in the world I would not have done for it.' End of section 9